to the people out there, my name is Automatic and welcome to episode 6 of Engines of Union Pacific. Last time we talked about the Alco Sentry 855, which received very positive feedback. Thank you very much everyone. Today, we'll be talking about the next engine in line, the DDA40X. This is an engine I've been wanting to talk about since I started the series, and I'm sure you know why. However, I'd like to quickly thank everyone who gave information on the community post for this engine. This wouldn't have been possible without your guys' help, including a certain person, who I'll mention later. Alright, with that said, let's talk about the DDA40X. It's getting close to the end of the 1960s. Much has happened on the Union Pacific throughout the last 20 years since the introduction of newer motive power in 1948. Three versions of gas turbines, new types of diesel motive power, and even a locomotive manufacturer competition requested by Union Pacific themselves and receiving three types of the strongest motive power they've ever received. So much has happened, and now it's getting close to the end of the 60s. If you're also aware, around this time, railroads across the U.S. were suffering from all sorts of problems like financial issues, old equipment, failing ridership, and poor track conditions. This, however, was mainly a problem in the eastern region of the United States. Most railroads of the west region, if anything, didn't really have much to worry about, Union Pacific thankfully being one of them. So thankfully, Union Pacific was mostly out of the danger zone. Regardless of all that, a big event was coming up too. The 100th anniversary of the driving of the Golden Spike which completed the first transcontinental railroad in the US was coming up. Concurrent with the three major locomotive builders research and development of high horsepower units in the late 1960s, Union Pacific design engineers were also hard at work. The idea of using two engines on a single chassis had come to fruition with the introduction of the GEU-50s, EMD's DD35A and B units, and ALCO's Century 855 models. The railroad's mechanical department still reasoned that it could design a bigger and more powerful diesel-electric locomotive than had been attempted by the three builders. EMD had the most successful units out of the three builders, with really only the truck designs being the one big complaint. Thus, the die was set, and this concept was reduced to layouts which would lead to placing an order of 25 units with Electromotive Division, along with GMC, starting on October 25th, 1968. The new units would be built based on lessons that were learned from the older DD35A and B units from 63 and 65. Using all the latest state-of-the-art electrical and mechanical technology available, the design embodies all low-maintenance features. The new units would be classified as another one of the experimental locomotives, as they would be an experiment for high horsepower freight trains. The UP placed an order of 25 units for $13,082,800. These units would be classified as DDA-40X. The first DDA-40X, which cost $523,312, was delivered to UP in April 1969, just in time for the 100th anniversary. However, the unit was first introduced on the system at Kansas City on May 7th, 1969. With the first unit ready just in time before the occasion, the unit had its UP licensing and numbers applied. It was decided that the numbers for the units of the class would be known as the 6900 class to commemorate the year the first transcontinental railroad was complete, which was 1869. 6900 was soon ready for the event pulling a special excursion called the Golden Spike Limited to Salt Lake City, Utah as quickly as they could. 
the large and long yellow unit, arrived in the early morning hours of May 10th, 1969, just in time. There, the locomotive will be put up on display for the public to see. Once the event was over, the Golden Spike Limited returned to Cheyenne being pulled by Union Pacific 8444. 6900 would later return as well to begin its revenue career. After the event, the unit along with the others would gain the nickname Centennial in honor of the 100th anniversary of the first Transcontinental Railroad. Over the next nine months, the Union Pacific would receive their whole order of EMD DDA-40X units from April to December 1969, numbered 6900 to 6924. Also, this is a funny side note. Unit 6901 wouldn't be completed until after 6902 and 6903 were built. Hmph, <laughs> how interesting. These units, along with the DD-35A units, would start to phase out the last of the GTEL turbines, which the UP were starting to sideline in favor of diesel mode of power instead. Regarding technical specifications, DD stood for DD axle arrangement for the trucks. A stood for A-type unit, 40 stood for model 40, and X stood for experimental as the locomotive was an experimental design. However, the units were originally arranged as DD-40AX, but this was later changed later on in their production. Because of this, the unit's name was unfortunately very inconsistent to most people, sometimes calling it DD-40, DD-40X, or DD-40AX. The units were rated for a top speed of 80 to 90 miles per hour and powered by a V16 diesel engine, or specifically, two EMD 16-cylinder 3300 645E3 prime movers which produced a total of 6600 horsepower with each one producing 3300 horsepower. However, what was interesting was the first three units ordered, 6900, 6901, and 6902, were delivered with a rated 7000 horsepower using 20% injectors. However, they were returned to the standard 6600 horsepower rating when 10% injectors were installed a year after their delivery. The units come at a hefty 545,000 pounds. It has a length of 98 feet 5 inches, a width of 10 feet 4 inches, and a height of 16 feet 4 inches. The units also came equipped with a turbocharger which is a turbine driven force induction device that increases an internal combustion engine's power output by forcing extra compressed air into the combustion chamber. The units also had wide nose calves which are very similar to those seen on the FP45 and F45 locomotives. These calves were very reminiscent of the Canadian comfort cabs seen on CN locomotives. The units also had 8,280 US gallon fuel tanks which is really necessary for a unit like this. Lastly, the units came equipped with either Leslie Super Typhon S5T RRO air horns or Leslie S3 LR air horns. Here are a few samples. Also, at some point, 6918 and 6924 were equipped with Thunderbolt 1003 sirens in mid-1979. These sirens were used to warn track maintenance personnel, however, they were later removed in 1980. Regardless, here's what that siren would have sounded like. <laughs> Now, 
Now then, let's talk about the things that made the DDA-40X unique in certain ways, as well as certain events that happened with them. Because if there's one thing, the DDA-40X units had a lot of stuff happen to them. First, we'll explain the new features that they had that other locomotives didn't have at the time. Introduction of module-type electrical components permitted fast troubleshooting and repair with new circuit cards. Load checking can be done through the unit's own grid system. All rotating equipment is designed for electrical operation rather than reducing overall efficiency through mechanical drives. One grid of fuel is used all year long as a heat exchanger was installed to maintain fuel oil temperatures. And lastly, the units had enunciators installed to provide a visual indication of any system malfunctioning, with readouts that can be studied by inspectors at a later time for possible action. In other words, welcome to the future, everyone! After proving successful throughout 1969, they were definitely keepers. The following year, a second batch of DDA-40X units would be ordered the following year with 20 more units being delivered between June 1970 and July 1971, numbered 6925 to 6946. The original agreed price was to be the same as the first 25 units, which was $523,312 for a onboard La Grange, Illinois. However, change orders increased the price with the last three units costing $551,168, with a total of 47 DDA-40X units along with 27 DD-35s and 15 DD-35As, Union Pacific was able to finally retire the last of their GTEL turbines. The units would mainly operate around the Midwest region of the United States but they would also sometimes travel down by the Southwest region. Examples of where they've been documented running in are Cajon Pass, Sherman Hill, North Platte to Ogden, etc. However, none of the units ever operated on Donner Pass as far as the documentations go. Which is actually kind of interesting. Throughout the 1970s, the units served extremely well with UP as well as being parts of special events and occasions. From March 27th to 30th, 1976, 6909 met up with SP4449 with the American Freedom Train during the Bicentennial and came nose to nose with the engine in Kansas City. On April 10th, 1979, Unit 6900 once again starred in the 110th anniversary of the first Transcontinental Railroad. The Centennials also appeared in Union Pacific commercials from the 70s. We're a million miles of history, a shining in the sun. We're the Union Pacific, and our glory will be won. We're the Union Pacific Railroad people. We can handle it. Several fail-free maintenance programs have maintained these units at peak efficiency. Designed as a major overhaul, these fail-free programs ensured maximum availability and minimum missed schedules, with units performing 20,000 revenue miles per month with a better than 90% availability. To put it frankly, the DDA-40X locomotive had become the world's biggest and most powerful diesel locomotive ever constructed, and still holds that position as of 2021. Some Union Pacific employees sometimes refer to the units as Big Jacks. <laughs> I wonder why. However, not all was flawless with the units, as two would be lost in accidents. On April 6th, 1974, Centennial number 6903 and 6924 were traveling down Cajon Pass until the train collided into the back of a Santa Fe freight train on Silvervan's Curve. The entire body of 6903 was completely shredded from the frame, while 6924 only suffered minor damage. 6924 survived the accident, was repaired, and returned to service, but the same couldn't be said for 6903. Unit 6903 was damaged beyond repair and the frame was offered to someone to be repurposed as a road bridge across a stream, which was never carried out 
and was eventually given to the Purdy Company in Lake Point, Utah, and was scrapped. Another unit, 6921, was wrecked at Point of Rocks, Wyoming on August 28, 1978. It was moved to Salt Lake, Utah for parts salvaging and later scrapped in Ogden, Utah in 1979. And actually, a third unit was also wrecked at one point. In June of 1978, 6940 was wrecked on the main line of Peru, Wyoming with its cab crushed. However, the damage wasn't as serious as the previous two units, and the unit was repaired and returned to service later that year. Now with slightly smaller numbers on its side compared to before. Regardless of incidents, the units were still doing really good on Union Pacific's roster, and would continue to operate into the 1980s. However, no matter how big or modern something can be, it doesn't last forever. The following year of the completion of the fleet, EMD would come out with the SD-40-2. This unit was not as big or strong as a DDA-40X, but it would show itself over that decade. Other locomotives would also show up during that decade. After a decade of service, all the units had accumulated as much as 2.2 million miles. At this point, UP had abandoned their quest for ever larger power and had on hand hundreds of much newer and more locomotives such as the SD-40-2s. Eventually, in 1980, Union Pacific would start to sideline the Centennials due to a decade of aging, high maintenance cost, and the downtown economics. As the transportation deepened, plans were made to place the units in long-term storage and move them to a more temperate climate. 25 units started being initially stored but serviceable at Omaha slash Council Bluffs, Iowa in May of 1980. 12 more were stored at North Platte, Nebraska, and the last 8, which were recently rebuilt, were stored at Salt Lake City. In October 1980, the 37 units stored at Council Bluffs and North Platte were gathered and stored down in Las Vegas, Nevada. In January and February of 1982, the 37 units were reunited with the last 8 units from Salt Lake, Utah, and moved and stored down in Yermo, California. In April and May of 1983, UP began removing coded cab signal equipment from the units to permit UP to end the use of UP pilot units on Chicago and Northwestern run-through freights operating on UP rails between Fremont and North Platte, Nebraska. The CCS equipment was given to the Chicago and Northwestern and they applied it to their SD-40-2s and SD-50s. In early September 1983, the units started being moved to Salt Lake City for removal of the big diesels, which were then transplanted into high mileage SD-40-2s. However, it was discovered the DDA-40X units were in much better shape than some of the SD-40-2s that were stored there. UP then decided to rethink this replacement program as rail traffic was increasing and they didn't have many options and unfortunately they couldn't trade in the Centennials to EMD. All that was available were high mileage SD40-2s, GP50s, SD50s, and borrowed Chicago and Northwestern GP50s as well as Missouri Pacific SD50s. The railroad had finally made their choice the UP decided to give the Centennials a second chance of service. In mid-January 1984, 6938 and 6942 were pulled out of storage and were put into the rebuild program. The plan was to get all the units rebuilt and back in service as soon as possible. The rebuild plan was of course very expensive, but still cheaper than other options, which is surprising. Within a month, 25 units were returned to service. Unfortunately, 15 of the units were unserviceable and never returned to service. Eight units were stored back at Yermo, California. Five more units were serviceable, but didn't go and also stayed at Yermo. Three were stored at Salt Lake City, and four went to Omaha slash Council Bluffs. 
The units that were returned to service were only used as trailing units in locomotive consists. However, five units, 6902, 6908, 6922, 6935, and 6942, were equipped with end-of-train devices and may have been used as lead units. By late 1984, the traffic surges had played out, and all 25 units once again were removed from service by December 23rd, 1984. In the following months, as many as 14 units only saw limited service. If you were to see a Centennial around this time, you'd consider yourself lucky, and by April 1985, all units were withdrawn from service. The last unit to operate and pull a freight train, number 6936, was on May 5th, 1985. And shortly after, the units were officially retired. But now, the fate of the big diesels was uncertain as their predecessor DD-35A and B units ended up being scrapped prior to this. So what would happen to the Centennials? The hope that the units would be saved from the scrap line was graphically shown by a somewhat artistic railfan in Salt Lake City. He used spray paint on highway viaduct pillars near UP's North Yard, asking the Union Pacific to save the whales, or save the 6900. Thankfully, Union Pacific heard the message and did just that. Thirteen units are now preserved to this day. 6900, the original DDA-40X, was preserved and put on display in Omaha, Nebraska, and later was moved to Council Bluffs, Iowa, until being moved to Omaha, Nebraska again, being relocated to Kennefick Park with Big Boy 4023 in 2005, where they still stand today, looking over the world. 6901 is currently on display at Ross Park in Pocatello, Idaho. 6911 is currently on display at the Mexico Museum of Technology in Mexico City. This is actually the only centennial not to be preserved in the United States. 6913 is currently on display at the Museum of American Railroad in Frisco, Texas. 6915 is currently on display at the Southern California Chapter Railway and Locomotive Historical Society in Pomona, California. They also have the unit's horn hooked up to pressurized compressed air, so you can actually blow the horn. 6916 is currently on display at the Utah State Railroad Museum in Ogden, Utah. 6922 is currently on display at Cody Park in North Platte, Nebraska, being displayed right next to Challenger 3977. 6925 unfortunately was stored at South Dakota Southern Railway's rail yard located in Chamberlain, South Dakota, having been used as a parts source and fuel storage. Thankfully, however, the engine is now owned by the Nebraska Railroad Museum, with money being raised to move it to its new home in Nebraska City as of 2021. 6930 is currently at the Illinois Railroad Museum in Union, Illinois. It can be used as a cab control unit, but not as a full locomotive as the engines and motors are currently non-operational. Also, someone please just spiffy up this unit already, it looks so bad. 6938 is currently on display at North Little Rock, Arkansas, and currently has a 150 badge on it to celebrate Union Pacific's 150th birthday in 2012. 6944 was put on display at the National Museum of Transportation in St. Louis, Missouri, and in 2014, it was sent to Altoona in July 2014 for cosmetic restoration which was completed in May 2015 and returned to the museum the following month. And lastly, 6946, the very last DDA-40X, was preserved by the Feather River Railroad Museum, now known as the Western Pacific Railroad Museum, in Portola, California. Oh, well, Mayor, I'd like to present you with this beautiful locomotive behind me, the uh, 6946. And for the non-railroad non buffs, this is the largest diesel locomotive ever constructed. It's 6,600 horsepower, 
and you have the pleasure of getting the first locomotive of this type that we've retired. Thank we you. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you very, very much. I am, I am awestruck. Awe this is just... Now, I know what most of you are saying. Otto, I think you missed one. Don't worry. I didn't. I decided to leave this one for last. I think you know why. Lastly, there's Union Pacific 6936, the only unit that was never retired in the fleet. After its last run on May 6th, 1985, 6936 was officially removed from regular service and was transferred to the Railroad's Heritage Fleet at Cheyenne, Wyoming. The unit ran its first excursion train on May 24th, 1985. Over the next 30 years, the unit would be part of excursion trains and sometimes even pull freight trains on occasion. Sometimes, the engine would be the diesel assist for 844 and 3985. Everything would be perfectly fine until one day. On November 30th, 2000, 6936 collided with a dump truck at a great crossing at Vatry, Louisiana. 20 miles north of New Orleans. The collision killed the dump truck driver as well as a UP employee inside the cab of the engine. The damage left 6936 in jeopardy as it was possible retirement could happen due to the damage. However, thankfully at a locomotive shop in North Little Rock, Arkansas, the public and shipper relations value of the unit dictated its repair and on May 2nd, 2001, the unit emerged once more, looking better than ever. The unit had its nose slightly modified to take hits better and make it safer. The unit was also given a new paint scheme that the Union Pacific called the Lightning Bolt Paint Scheme, which is the current paint scheme on most Union Pacific locomotives today. And on the front nose, a small version of the Union Pacific Wing Shield logo was applied. Because of these changes, some people now classify the unit as DD-40X. I'm not one of those people for your information. After this, the unit returned to its usual service with the Heritage Fleet. Throughout the 2000s, the engine made several trips across the country and sometimes paired with 844 or 3985 on occasions. Also on some occasions, the unit also met up with some of its brethren, such as 6900 in 2005, 6946 in 2007, and 6930 in 2013. In 2011, UP made another modernization addition to 6936 by changing its red outlined running board to having the modern yellow tape outlined running board. However, since 2017, the unit has been kept in storage in the Cheyenne Roundhouse and is now claimed to only operate on occasions. I'm not sure when we'll see it run again, but only time can answer that. The one good thing I can say is 6936 is at least safe from the elements outside, so the locomotive will be perfectly fine. And maybe one day, we'll see it again, out there, showing the true power of Union Pacific. The DDA-40X units were definitely a very special locomotive considering how much happened to them. Being the engine to represent 100 years of the first transcontinental railroad, being the biggest and strongest diesel in the world, and having a very messy service. 
Regardless of all that, they definitely left their mark in the history of Union Pacific. The Great Big Rollin' Railroad. Thanks for watching this episode of Engines of Union Pacific. This locomotive was really fun to talk about, and I'd like to thank you all for watching this. I'd also like to thank the people who appear in the credits who helped provide info for this engine, including, once again, Andy W. for providing obscure info as well as obscure pictures that, I even, that even I didn't know about. On top of this, I would also like to thank all of you for helping me reach 5,000 subscribers on this channel. It definitely lets me know that you all love my content and it keeps me wanting to keep doing stuff on this channel, as well as this series. I'll make sure to keep the series going as long as I can to make you all happy. Next up in line will be the EMD SD40-2. Again, like last time, a community post will go up on my channel for the next engine in line. There, you can leave important information as well as pictures for this engine. Oh, and here's a little thing you can do in the comment section below that I actually thought of as I was making this episode. Try and figure out how many times I said 69 in this episode because I'm sure it's a lot. Post it in the comment section below and tell me how many times I said it. Because I just want to know how many times I said it. Until then, stay tuned for more. Thank you all for watching, and with that said, this is Automatic, signing off! We're a great big rolling railroad, here the diesel engine's power. We're a thousand wheels of freight train, doing 90 miles an hour. Like a mighty rushing torrent, with the power you can feel. Surging through our nation's heartland, on a river made of steel. From the shores of California, where the blue Pacific gleams, to the father of the waters, rolling down to New Orleans. We have forged a span of steel that links our nation east and west. We're the Union Pacific, doing what we do the best. From New Orleans to Seattle is 3,000 miles away. Across the rivers, plains, and mountains, and we're going there today. We were there to bridge the rivers when our country still was new. We're the Union Pacific. We can handle it.